do you have to have love or passion for cooking to be a good cook or, or are those things overrated? It is and it isn't. That is that's the point, you know, consistency in the kitchen is extremely important. But if you really, when you realize yourself, when you taste your own dish, you realize yourself that today was really, really good. That day you put some love in it, otherwise it won't work. You cannot really cook indifferently. Welcome to Friends of Anthony Bourdain, a podcast where we talk to some of Anthony Bourdain's friends and colleagues uh, throughout his culinary journey. I am your host, Emily Fedner, a cook, host, content creator, and pop-up owner. And I'm your other host, Fabrizio Villapondo, a food blogger, social media cook, recipe developer, uh, who's relatively new to the game, but uh, has been in restaurants for many years. Don't forget, ex-clumsy waiter. And definitely an ex-clumsy <laughs> waiter. Well, today we had the absolute honor of speaking to Jacques Papin, and I feel like we're both still kind of coming down from that. I mean, I was extremely, I didn't even drink coffee. I was just so excited for this interview. And, and honestly, I mean, Emily knows me. Truthfully, I have not been in this game for too long. And this not, I'm not saying that to discredit myself, but just to be very straightforward. And, you know, I didn't know about Jacques Papin. I've only known about him for a few years. And guess who introduced me to him? Anthony Bourdain, of Anthony course. Bourdain, of course. Um, well, he is just a culinary giant, but what I think stood out to me more than the conversations about food as the great democratizer and um, life in the kitchen and learning from other people is really just his humility, mm -hmm. his kindness, and he just seems like the sweetest person ever and, and not even close to being a snob, even though he is revered as one of the best chefs on planet Earth. Just just a truly lovable human being who has been in a not so lovable industry for decades. And he gives us some insight on his perspective on, you know, celebrity chefs and even our new interpretation of celebrity stardom, which I think, you know, TikTok and Instagram, social you know, media. You know, like Fabrizio, like <laughs> a TikTok chef. <laughs> I don't know, you seem to like me, all right. <laughs> if you don't know how to eat and you don't love eating, how can you be expected to cook? This is my problem, like they've had like the 17 year old chef. You, yeah. you can't even drink yet, you little pisher. Don't tell me that, you know, <laughs> you can, <laughs> you're a chef. You know, how can you, you, uh. Yeah, I know, I see that. <laughs> I see that in school, three months, and say, oh, I have a great idea for a book. Oh, gee, I have a great idea for a television show. I say, oh, yeah, yeah. why don't you, you peel that asparagus the right way? <laughs> <laughs> and he gives us some perspective, too, on like the importance of, of food, of food, how it transcends beyond ingredients and uh, standing in a kitchen for hours. Yeah. It was such a pleasure speaking to the man that made Anthony Bourdain, I would argue, the most giggly I've ever seen him on screen. Oh, he was he was maybe even more giddy than you and I were to speak to Jacques Pepin and he I feel like I have on so many occasions heard Anthony Bourdain reference Jacques Pepin's omelet, mm. the legendary mm -hmm. omelet. So obviously we spoke about omelets and how to make the perfect omelet. Yeah, I think it's just beautiful hearing stories and a perspective I, I think from someone who was very similar to Bourdain in terms of ideologies and, and beliefs in the culinary space and in life but from completely different walks of life and backgrounds. Exactly. They had so many similar uh, outlooks and so much humility expressed in different ways, but it was so clear that they both had this admiration for each other, which was mm. so so cool. What kind of personality type is required to be a good cook? Or, or is there such... Hard worker, consistency, you know, being there on time and all that too. All of that is extremely, extremely important. So that's one first level. Then the second level, if you have that type of commitment, then you learn the trade and you become a craftsman. And the craftsman is purely a question of rep repeat, you know, do it over and over and over and over and over so that it kind of became part of your DNA. So that that the time you can afford to let it go, disappear, because now you can stand in front of an audience, talk, your hands are working, and you can think in terms of combination of ingredients or whatever too. That the technical part of the food itself, to being a craftsman, you know, to, do, to, to be a technician. But I know a fair amount of very good technicians in the kitchen, which are relatively lousy cook. The food is never very good. So, you know, this is not the end of it, but it's a good start. But if you are 
the type of commitment that I talk, if you become a good technician, then if you happen to have talent, then you have the know-how of those techniques to take that talent and take it somewhere. And if you infuse a little bit of love in it, then you may get to extraordinary food like, you know, like Thomas Keller or Eric Ripper or, or Jean-Georges, or those are extraordinary chefs, you know. So we had a beautiful conversation yeah. and uh, I still, I can't stop smiling. I know. Well, yeah. you guys, now everyone gets to listen to the great Jacques Pepin. Hello, everyone. I mean, everyone. Hello, Jacques. We are, I think I can speak for Fabrizio and I when I say this is a huge honor. And I'm also sure that you've heard that a million times, but I'm sure it never gets old. Welcome. We are extremely excited to have a chat with you and talk about uh, your friend, Anthony Bourdain. Fabrizio yeah. and Emily, very nice meeting you too. And uh, I'm glad to be with you for a little while. Well, to kick things off, as I was, you know, learning more about you and your, your background, because I think that is a huge part of why you are such an irreverent chef and influence on so many people. What really struck me about you throughout everything I read was that, and one of my favorite things that I read was your disdain for snobbery. You seem to really hate culinary snobbery, which, you know, I thought was so interesting, something I really identified with. Would you say that has to do with how you grew up and were brought up in France and during the wartime? Partially, without any question. I mean, when I was a kid, the cook was in the kitchen and, uh, you know, any good mother would have wanted a, a child to marry the lawyer, a doctor, not a cook. And now all of a sudden, we are genius. <laughs> so, <laughs> what happened? You can... Really, you can't take it too seriously. I mean, we are, uh, yeah, we do good things, but I mean, we're still a uh, mashed potato maker, you know. So, I mean, <laughs> it's not like brain surgery. So, uh, yes, certainly uh, at that time, uh, the world was quite different. And if you work in a restaurant, the idea was to conform, to know there, to try to see the food through the eye of the chef, uh, through his sense of aesthetic. Uh, or her sense of aesthetic or sense of taste, and uh, to try to duplicate it. It wasn't supposed to express yourself, you know, and you would do that. When I worked at the Plaza Athene in Paris in the 50s, we were 48 chefs in the kitchen, and we did, Plaza Athene was famous for the lobster souffle, for example. I'm sure the 48 chef could have done the lobster souffle, you would never have known who has done it. That was the idea, which is quite different now. Watching a lot of your interviews and you being against sort of like that culinary snobbery. And I noticed that you also love to talk about wine. When, when asked what's your favorite part about cooking, you talk about drinking wine. And I believe in a great interview that you had with Tony in New York, he asked you, what is your favorite wine? And you said, I believe, I don't mean to paraphrase, I think you said, shit wine. And <laughs> uh, I, I thought that was an incredible answer. I related to that a lot. I'm assuming that in the past, you've maybe taken the wine drinking a little too far and Tony has a famous quote where he talks about his hangover cure. I believe he said aspirin, a cold beer, and spicy Szechuan. So I'm curious to ask you, what is Jacques Pepin's hangover cure? Hangover cure, well, we had in France what we call a rince cochon, you know, a pig's rancin, which is the sparkling water with lemon juice and uh, sparkling water, lemon juice, and a bit of a uh, syrup of cassis or something like that in there, you know, but I usually um, have another glass of wine for a cure. <laughs> Wait, I was literally just about to say that. I feel like we can relate. <laughs> yeah, no, we did. Me and, me and Emily definitely show uh, an affinity for wines of all uh, qualities. And as long as there's wine, then we are happy. I love that, uh, that whole vibe of yours. And I was laughing so hard the other night when I was listening to you talk to Tony and you were like, I'm sick of these tablespoons of wine with these wine tasting menus. Like, you don't want that. You want a glass of wine. Yes, yes. I mean, if I had one of those big tasting menus, I like to have a glass of champagne and you give me a white wine and a red wine, but 15 different types of wine and sniffing it and two, I want to go out for a beer and a taco somewhere. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's so precious. It's what a, what's one of the most precious meals that you've ever been tasked with cooking given for a long period of time. You did not, you know, cook necessarily your own food, but worked at other restaurants. 
Right. Well, you know, certainly when I worked in Paris, and depending who you work for, you know, I work for the president in France, of course, so you, you know, you have to do fancy and nice dinner and different type of wine and set it up the right way. I mean, but there are limits to this, you know, that like, the limit for me in the kitchen about uh, the presentation of the food, it should be presented nicely, it should show the food at its best, but what I call uh, punctuation cooking, which is a little bottle where they put a comma, a comma, a question mark, a comma to with the little bottle to, I mean, that, that, uh, no, that's too much for me. You know? Punctuation cooking. That <laughs> is an amazing name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, by then, the, the food is cold. People clean the plate. They clean it again. To, and it has been too touch, you know, to be to be that attractive for me. You know, so you know. Being said, I, I still like to have food well presented and nicely. And it's also a different when you whether you go to a three star restaurant or whether you go to a bistro. Because I mm -hmm. remember years ago, I've been teaching at Boston University for forty three years now, something like that. Yeah. And I took a group, well, a number of years ago, I took a group to uh, to France. I was in the south of France, and we went to Lulu Perrault, uh, which is uh, uh, a winery, you know, in, in the south of France, pretty well known. And she was a great cook. She died a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, Domaine Tempier, you know, Domaine Tempier is a pretty well-known wine in the, near Toulon. And uh, she cooked little... Uh, leg of lamb and uh, she had apricot from the garden she made a sherbet with it too the food was fantastic straightforward too and the night the same night i took the group to uh, the hotel de paris in monte carlo for ducasse at a three-star restaurant you know and of course it was different but interestingly enough the way people analyzed it there was a great deal of similarity except for the decoration and the restaurant mm -hmm. and so forth. but something very straightforward you know in the cooking itself even do cast. So, I mean, that's more my type of cooking. But mm -hmm. yeah. at the end of the day, good food is good food. And I feel like the ability to appreciate every level of cooking is really important. That was a big part of Anthony Bourdain's legacy and the impression he left, I think, on a lot of people, his ability to love noodles at a street stall in Vietnam, the same way he loves Eric Repair's cooking, for instance. Mm -hmm. The only thing that sets an amateur home cook apart from a seasoned chef is technique and perhaps the right tools for the job. Anthony Bourdain famously revered the knife as the ultimate kitchen tool, deeming the callus it leaves on a chef's hands a mark of professionalism. A crucial companion to a knife is a cutting board, essential for maintaining blade sharpness. You can feel it when you shake my hand, he said, just as I feel it on others of my profession. It's a secret sign. And you can't use a knife without a cutting board, a must, especially if you want to maintain the sharpness of your knife for a longer period. The Friends of Anthony Bourdain podcast is partnered with John Booze, renowned for its Booze Blocks, top-notch cutting surfaces, butcher blocks, and more, all crafted in the USA. Trusted by chefs worldwide, Booze Block cutting boards are made from sustainably sourced American hardwoods like hard rock maple, American cherry, and American black walnut. Many are NSF certified, scientifically proven to inhibit bacteria growth, ensuring safety and sanitation. John Booz & Co. prioritizes sustainability using renewing timbers and following best practices for forest regeneration. Since 1887, they've upheld a tradition of creating high quality kitchen products for chefs globally. As a special offer to podcast listeners, visit www.johnbooz.com. That's J-O-H-N-B-O-O-S dot com. Use promo code PODCAST15 and enjoy a 15% discount on your purchase. This offer cannot be combined with any other promotions. So speaking of the man, myth and the legend, can you recall the first time you met Anthony Bourdain and, and what that was like? I met him uh, when he was at the, in the late 90s, I forget exactly the date, but uh, when he was at Le Al in Paris as the chef uh, in, uh, in uh, Park Avenue there in New York. And... Uh, yeah, I mean, I spoke with him. I think he came. I went there for dinner and I spoke with him. And then after that, frankly, it's when he published uh, uh, Kitchen Confidential. I think he sent me a book or someone sent me a book anyway that I read. And I agree entirely with him. Certainly the context of, you know, giving a basket of bread to uh, to people at table eight and they don't touch it and you have to throw it out in the garbage when you come back to the kitchen or a piece of bread. <laughs> That's totally ridiculous. You know, many things like that in the kitchen. So I thought he was absolutely right. And mm -hmm. I think I told him too. And we, uh, yeah, we spoke together a few times too. He was, he was a very, very impressive man, very intelligent to start mm -hmm. with, very bright, 
very humble in many ways. You know, he didn't take himself too seriously. And uh, uh, so, yes, I, uh, I liked him a lot. Yeah. Something that I really admire about him and liked about him was even though he had like the rock and roll persona, I'm curious to ask you, was, he seemed like he was kind of a shy, uh, there's like a softness to him and a vulnerability that I think not many people talk about. So I'm curious, the first time that you meet him, I'm sure, like, what was your first impression? Was he nervous? Uh, was he very excited to speak to you? Well, I don't know whether he was very excited, but I mean, we spoke for a while. I didn't speak with him very long, but uh, yes, there, were, there, there, there was a shyness to it, and uh, like someone who is unpretentious, so he mm. does. I don't know if you ever seen PBS did an American master on me on the art of craft. It's called. He's the one starting the show there, uh, and it's really the best part of the show is probably him starting the show. You know when he tells people something to the effect that uh, if you have a, uh, someone that you spend the night with, uh, uh, you know, make sure that uh, in the morning you get up early to make an omelet according to Jacques. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so it was really a funny, a funny <laughs> show. Yeah. A great quote. It's... And I, I feel like the omelet, the iconic omelet comes up a lot and was clearly a yeah. source of, of Tony's admiration. Can you maybe walk us through the perfect omelet briefly? Well, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not really complicated. I mean, when I was a kid in, uh, in Paris, often you work in restaurants and, uh, you know, often the chef will tell you make an omelet to start with kind of to judge your your proficiency, you know, with, with the technique, I mean, basic technique. But the, the type of omelette that we do here is the type of omelette that my mother does in France too. My mother never did a classic French omelette as I do, even though she had restaurants all her life, as well as my cousin. As, I mean, there were 12 restaurants in France in my family, I can't count, 12 of them run by women. I was the first male to go into that business. So the, the aunt, the cousin and all that, my sister-in-law, and all, they all had restaurants. And I remember even when I was a chef to the president in France, going back to Lyon to my aunt and go to a restaurant, she drove me out. She said, you too much better get out of here. <laughs> no one was very impressed with me <laughs> being with the president. So yes, certainly a different type of omelette. Uh, we do a classic omelette, which is slightly different because you move it as fast as you can, like for scrambled eggs, to have a texture which is very, very smooth and incline the pan at the end so all the whole mixture goes on one side so you just leave one lip, the other lip, and avert it. It should, should, should not be brown because that toughens the eggs and mm. it should be very creamy inside and so forth. Now, this is a classic French omelette. Is it better than the, the omelette we get in a cafeteria there or whatever? No, not really. It's, it's different. You know, it's a question mm. of taste too. So, you know, Sometimes I'm in the mood for a kind of very coarse omelette with potato and bacon, whatever. And some of the time you're in the mood for. I mean, I did the, the ultimate omelette for my wife, Gloria, who loves caviar. So I did a, a, a one, I think it was a one egg or a two egg omelette, small omelette this way, French classic omelette. I stuffed the center with uh, with uh, red caviar, salmon caviar, mm -hmm. and I put it on the plate. And then I have... Uh, Payushnaya. Payushnaya is pressed caviar. You know, I know if you ever use pressed caviar, but it's like a paste done with caviar. So I took a piece of that that I can spread on the table very, very thin like this, and I wrapped the omelette into this. So the omelette was wrapped in black caviar with the red caviar inside. So that was the ultimate omelette. That is life. that is luxurious. Is that paste similar to, is it like um, a a softer version of Botarga, kind of? Is it cured? No, it, the point is that when you, when you have an overripe, underripe, overripe, if you call something caviar, it has to be sturgeon eggs. Otherwise, it has to be specified salmon caviar or whatever caviar, but if you say caviar. So the different type of sturgeon, etc., cetera, beluga and so forth, at the end of the year, when they have overproduction, underripe, overripe, they put all, all together, resalt it, and press it. So it's like a paste which is thick, but you can take a piece of that and spread it on the table very, very thin, which I do. I have, I have them because I made a recipe and uh, uh, California caviar is doing a pressed caviar, uh, you know, that, that I did the recipe for. So uh, it's, it's different. I love that. It's interesting too, because I worked at the Russian Tea Room years ago, 
And then at that point, you know, you have beluga, ocetra, severiga, the different types of eggs. And payoustaya, which is the press caviar, was very well known. When I worked in Paris, it was very well known too. And now I talk to chefs that never even have heard of payoustaya or press caviar. So it's funny the way it disappeared. It's kind of coming back a little bit. But <laughs> I, for one, am very excited about everyone's current embracing of different types of roe and different types of fish and things that aren't just famous or, or fancy. And I grew up with all of that food because my parents are from Ukraine. So I'm no stranger to salmon roe. That sounds like the most iconic iconic omelet to, to ever exist. I think that now there's a lot of things culinarily that are coming back. Uh, I have uh, friends that have books from the 1900s, French cooking technique. And, and it's, I was kind of curious, what is your perspective? Because I know that you've said that you want to see more people cooking at home. So yeah. I'm curious, what is your perspective on a lot of these young folks on social media that are self-proclaimed chefs or they're a little bit humbler, thankfully, and just say, I'm a home cook and here's a video, a recipe that I made? It is, it is amazing without any question. I mean, for me, at the beginning of the pandemic, my daughter Claudine told me, why don't you do, she does Facebook for me. I don't really do Facebook. Mm -hmm. She does Facebook, so she said, why don't you do some show on Facebook, two minutes, three minutes, four, maybe at the most, uh, to show people what you have left in your refrigerator, did that too. So we did 320 of those so far in like three years. In fact, we're shooting tomorrow, and I'll probably do between eight and 10. Usually I do a day when we do it. As I say, those are about three, four minutes. And there is two people, there is Tom Hopkins with the, he, he has a camera, a fixed camera, and then mm -hmm. uh, his telephone to shoot uh, close up on my shoulder. So there's two people in the kitchen, that's it. And uh, so we, we do those, and it has been kind of amazing. I mean, we have 1.8 million people on, on Facebook now, uh, thanks to my daughter. And uh, we do very simple stuff, like what my wife used to call fridge soup. I open mm. the refrigerator, I pick up wealthy salad, a piece of onion, carrot, too fine. We put it and we do a soup, finish it with a bit of pasta or, or whatever in it. So frozen stuff, whatever I have around. I think that the pandemic probably cost a lot of divorce, but it did cost a lot of people <laughs> coming together and cooking also, which never did before. So it's been, mm. uh, it's been very uh, upful in that sense, you know, and, and good. So... It's a different type of thing that it used to be. I mean, years ago, there is a dichotomy in this country of some people cooking a lot, and going to, even going to, I mean, there is market now, a lot of farmers market going there. So it go back to the way it used to be generation mm -hmm. ago. And on the other hand, uh, you know, if you go in the, you know, in, in, in the big uh, supermarket and all that, or, or the big uh, shopping center, rather. You have those little restaurants where people eat poor things. They eat hot dog, hamburger, uh, fried chicken, and pizza, or whatever. Mm -hmm. but it goes over and over again. So there is a dichotomy of people really cooking a lot, interested in cooking, and other people who don't at all, you know. Yeah. But unfortunately, for most European they look at American cooking in the context of the second example that American only eat hamburger stuff like this, which is of course not true. You know? Yeah, and also the you know Amer what even is American cooking? Because American cooking is just other people's cooking repackaged, kind of as as American cooking. But it's interesting because as you were speaking, the whole phenomenon of the social media chef really, in a way, reminds me of the original phenomenon of the celebrity chef because mm -hmm. it's this existing art form that is taking on new meaning and new cultural significance. And I do believe there's good and bad sides to it. But I think that I laughed when you said something to Anthony Bourdain. You were like, well, you wouldn't be sitting here if that didn't happen. <laughs> he was like, to, he was, I don't know if you remember that. He was, you guys were discussing the concept of the celebrity chef and he, you know, had he described his, it as a monster that you, <laughs> that you helped create. Um, yeah, a monster. That he, yeah. There's both good and bad sides to it. I think that using one of your continuous lessons, I think if anything's approached with humility and honesty and curiosity, it's a beautiful thing um, without ego, without mm -hmm. the ego. But both the celebrity chefs and the social media chefs, I think that's a big thing. Yeah, well, I mean, what was extraordinary about uh, Anthony is that he made you discover another country and discover people in those countries mm -hmm. through the food itself. And for me, it has always been my, 
my motto. I mean, you know, I remember traveling in Yugoslavia uh, by car 30 years ago with my wife. We go through a little village and, you know, people move behind the curtain, look at you, foreigner, boy, you're foreigner, you're dangerous. And you're there. Then you stop at the village bistro there and you sit down and you order by hand. You don't know the language. You order a things of wine and some of the food and all of a sudden people sit around you then you send them a bottle of wine and all of a sudden you're normal i mean you eat that you drink that too so yes this is how to you to know people i mean for me through food without any question absolutely that's what he did, that's what he did for many country i mean each time i look at his show no reservation or, or uh, kitch, uh, forget the, the other that's that, unknown Yes, right. So I, I could I, I discover stuff from that country that I would have never have known over there, and that lead you to the political situation in that country or whatever it is. But it was very, very, very important. Very yeah. important. I think I think one of the most important things too is, especially in a country like the United States, I feel like Tony sparked this curiosity for people to care about other foods that wasn't a hamburger or a slice of pizza and. Right. Uh, American pizza. I don't want any Italians to get mad <laughs> claiming that it is American food. Tony introduced people like me, Emily, people all, all over the world, new things. I'm curious, you as someone who's highly respected, you've been in the industry for decades, extremely talented. Many would say you're their mentor. What is something that Tony maybe showed you that you, whether it was in regards to cooking, just something in life, maybe even like a cool band? Like something that Tony showed you that you were like, wow, this will stick with me. How to drink beer? <laughs> <laughs> no, but no, I learned a lot from him. I mean, each time I look at him, you know, I can go to West Africa, I've been to West Africa, Russia, China, and so forth. And I can always learn if you keep your eye open, you know, you learn with people. I mean, I can probably, I did a book on chicken not too long ago, but I could probably do 10,000 mm -hmm. recipes of chicken if you go from West Africa to Turkey to China with a, wow, I've, ne I've never done a chicken this way. So there mm -hmm. is always something to learn. If you keep an open mind, whoever you cook with, you will learn something. Sometimes you learn what not to do, but <laughs> you learn stuff. <laughs> you you do learn stuff. So, yes, with him be been very comfortable with uh, with cooking with him because uh, we did a couple of competitions like that with uh, he did with Eric Repair and him mm -hmm. and uh, I was with my daughter Claudine in Florida at some point I forget when it was, it was fun that just reminded me I was thinking about cooking and cooking as the great democrat cooking and food as the great democratizing you know sort of medium cooking and food apply to everyone if you were to cook for I don't know if you ever did cook for Anthony Bourdain in like a personal level dinner party level but if you were to throw a dinner party and he was one of the guests what what would be the meal you would make for him? Well, I would try to find out to start with what he likes to eat or not. Cooking is to please someone, to make them happy. So if all of a sudden he turned around, he hates artichokes or, I don't know, sweet bread or whatever it may be, then of course I wouldn't do that. Yes, if I have a friend coming too, if I have other friend who knows him or her, I say, you know what they like to eat? Yes, of course you try to do what people, for him, if, I don't know anything, you know, that no one ever told me anything to. I would have kept the food quite simple, you know, from a, a straight roast chicken to a gratin of potato and, you know, maybe an apple tart and, uh, uh, you know, something straightforward, simple. Can we come over? <laughs> maybe even a side of that Popeye's mac and cheese that he always... Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, Jacques Pepin mac and cheese. Yeah, I, I right. think that'd be better. Something that stood out to me in an interview they had with Tony is you spoke about how food transcends cooking and ingredients. And it's for many people a sign of comfort and security and nostalgia. I'm curious, what what, what is a dish that brings you back to little Jacques Pepin and just makes you feel like a little boy again, just feeling well, at home and you know i was raised during the war in france so that's what i'm probably a very miserly cook because my mother could cook with with uh, practically nothing mm -hmm. but certainly the, the the food that you have as a child is very visceral you know it's very uh, powerful and it comes back to you those tastes you know and for me a child coming out of school like when i was a kid your place if you're in the kitchen you know, and spending your time in the kitchen, the other voice of your mother, the voice of your father, the smell of that kitchen, 
the clinging of the instrument, you know, and uh, and the smell, the taste, that stay with you the rest of your life. You know, mm-hmm. those are very powerful memory, and you see that with uh, a young American kid in uh, in Afghanistan or in uh, whatever a young uh, soldier there. What do you think they dream at night? They dream of his father clam chowder, his mother uh, a lobster roll, or whatever it may be. So at that point, the food transcends the level of the physiological function of food, which is to nourish you, it becomes home, it becomes security, it becomes mm-hmm. love, it becomes family, it becomes all of this. And certainly, wherever you are born, you know, part of the country, there is some of those dishes which will remain like that for you forever. And for me, if I have my mother, uh, cream uh, chicken in cream sauce with tarragon on top, I can close my eyes, I don't have to look at it, I say, that's my mother's chicken, you know, so... Mm-hmm. Yes, without any question, those are very powerful memory. Your dish sounds exquisite. I was having a sloppy joe. I don't know if you know what a sloppy joe is. Sloppy joe is pretty good. Yeah, and I had that moment where I just closed my eyes and I was like, this is my mother's cream chicken with tarragon. Sounds beautiful. It is It is true, though, at a certain point, you know, we eat for deliciousness and we eat to learn about other cultures, but the core purpose and, and the most like emotional aspect of food is mm-hmm. the is the foods that bring you back to your childhood and, and the way you grew up. And I've been listening to your book and I identified with some of your earlier memories of the way your mother used to cook with what was available, because in a way, the, the war that shaped your taste buds is kind of the war that shaped my taste buds, because my grandparents were in the Holocaust and... And my parents were refugees from the Soviet Union. So their ability and their their method of cooking, it just sounded so familiar to what yeah. you were describing. So here's people in different areas of the world and, and emotionally shaped by, by similar events. If you ask my daughter, she's only 50 now, what is the best dish? So she will have a soup of vermicelle, you know, which, called, which is just a chicken broth too with a leek in it. And we finish with the, with the small pasta uh, from her grandmother, from my mother. She remembered that. You know, from me, she remember probably a fondue, you know, the uh, grated cheese from her mother. I know the the, the spaghetti and clam sauce, uh, you know, so you you will attribute, you know, certain type of dishes to different type of people in your family. And that's what you remember from them. Yes, mm. the I think that's why I found it really important when you said, I think Tony asked you, what, what do you want to see in the industry more? And uh, you just simply answered more cooking at home because I, I think you had a... You laughed at the idea, and I've heard this before a lot too. I think it's a very American thing. Is you see a family, they have a few kids, and they're like, "We're gonna have dinner as a family at least once a month." Oh yeah, and, which is unfortunately too common, and you know, and uh, I think it was very beautiful. You know that what you want to see more is just more people yeah. cooking. And, and the so, rest of the time, you have. I, I was in a restaurant a few days ago. There, Chinese restaurant. There was a couple in their 30 or early 40s when they had two kids, like one eight years old, the other one nine, ten. The four of them had their telephone in front of their nose. No one talked to anyone, so that's, that's horrible. You know, yeah. I mean, that could be the first thing, you know, remove those things at least two hours a day while you're eating. <laughs> sure. Yeah, be, be present, enjoy the meal time. So of course, you know, memories of French food and your mother's French cooking are a huge part of you and um, your food memories. I know that Anthony Bourdain, France held a special place in his heart and was tragically where he passed away. Did you ever spend any time with Anthony in France? Did you ever speak about French food and and connections to it? No, I I never spent time with him in France, but uh, I remember talking to him about food, even his family. I think his father and all that were in the oyster business or all the other place where there was oyster. So we talk about those oyster in the southwest of France, which is a place where I lived for a while when I was in, in the Navy. So, uh, yeah, of course, we talked about uh, those type of memory, those type of, uh, of food. And, and for me, as I said, it was very important for him as he traveled the world, you know, to start with the food, you know, and the street food, usually that's where you really you really start to know people much more mm-hmm. than maybe in the restaurant. Yeah, the beauty of him is that it was what well, he was easy to be with because he wasn't a snub, you know, he could be uh, in trouble, you know, excited as much as I would by a great uh, baguette and butter on top of it uh, than uh, by an extraordinary dish otherwise, you know, it didn't really matter what it is. And I kind of agree with that. 
what what was what's your favorite street food? Street food? <laughs> I don't know. I can't. I am a glutton, basically. You know, if you <laughs> eat a lot of me, I'll swallow it. I'll eat it. So, uh, fine. Street food. I don't know. I don't think that pizza is street food. If a good pizza, I love a pizza. You know, I love a hamburger occasionally, a hot dog as well. You know, any of that stuff. I love, but that doesn't prevent me from uh, getting to the garden, getting salad and uh, mm. fresh salad done with uh, whatever I just did with my cucumber there. See, my cucumber here at the garden, I'm overwhelmed with them. I put them in the food processor with olive oil and I put on top of it some V8, spicy V8, you know. <laughs> uh, because, I mean, that will season it. In one second, I had a, a gazpacho there, you know, of uh, gazpacho. <laughs> I love that. Well, the high low. I think that's that's the great thing about you is sort of how it doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. You know, I think you can go have that sloppy slice of pizza on the street and then have a beautiful cucumber cold soup. And I guess I, I think a lot of uh, a lot of chefs or even you know social media chefs have are very opinion opinionated nowadays. Where you know if it if it's not caviar or fine dining or wagyu beef, it's garbage, and uh, it's it's refreshing talking to not just a chef, but you know a very highly regarded chef who's like, yeah, I I like Oreos, and I also love you know yeah. high quality ingredients yeah. and foods. Oreos are a culinary feat. I completely <laughs> agree. It's one of my favorite things of all time. But you know, if you go to have work in so many the Meurice in Paris, Maxime, Fouquet, the Plaza Athene, and so forth. On those big restaurants, you know, you work, you work, so a lot of pressure in the kitchen, you move, you finish the, 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 the evening, you sit down. What do you think people eat? Bread, butter, salami, pate, cheese. We bring all of the pate, cheese, salami, and that's what the chef eat most of the time. Maybe Just a, a bowl of, of wine each. Oh, yeah, you, sure. you don't really eat anything else. It's <laughs> so. funny. You can spend all night. I've, I've served dinners where I'm serving caviar and truffles and fancy New Year's Eve dinners. And you know what I eat at the end of the night? I take all the leftover scraps of pasta from the dinner after cutting fresh pasta. I boil that. I use a mountain of butter, Parmesan cheese, and that's my dinner after mm. I'm done serving a seven-course meal. <laughs> that's why you look so good. Yeah. <laughs> I will take that compliment to the grave. <laughs> well, we also really wanted to talk to you about your foundation. So if maybe you could tell us in your own words a little bit more about the Jacques Pepin Foundation and uh, why you started, that would be amazing. Yeah, I mean, I tell you, I was in apprenticeship in 1949. So it's a long, long time ago. So I've been in the kitchen. Now in the last few years, Claudine, my daughter, has created Facebook and my son-in-law has done the foundation. And my friend Tom here, who shoot the Facebook, I've done my art site for my money. I would never have done any of those things, you know, and I'm very grateful. But certainly, uh, Rory, my son-in-law, who has been a chef for 30 years now or more, uh, at some point decided to teach at Johnson & Well a few years ago. And uh, he went to college, but I said, you know, if, you, if you're going to be there as a teacher, you won't pay to go back to school. So he went on and got a master and got a PhD eventually in education. So now with a full professor there, you know, I did 13 series of like 26 shows for PBS. So hundreds and hundreds of shows through the year. And he extrapolate technique out of that to, to put on Instagram and all that. But at some point he said, you've been teaching all your life in, at the French Culinary Institute, BU and so forth. Who would you like to teach now? So we thought about it. And I said, maybe people who have been a bit... Uh, disenfranchised by life, like people who come out of jail, you know, homeless people, former drug addict, even veterans, you know. So that's what we do through community kitchen throughout the country. And it's very rewarding. I mean, I personally feel that I can teach someone in six weeks, six, eight weeks, how to peel a, you know, asparagus and how to peel an onion and uh, poach an eggs and wash salad. And so you have the basic of the kitchen in six, eight weeks. If you like it, if you like it, you're likely to stay there and move forward. Maybe five years later, you're the chef in that little restaurant. Mm. And you have redone your life. You know, you make a living. It makes you feel good. Feeding people is a, is a nice way to live too. I mean, especially in the era of polarization and all that, you know, uh, uh, there is not much polarization in the kitchen. You know, I mean, uh, uh, we have a, a motto, on that thing who said, everyone looked the same in the eye of the stove. And it's true. Uh, you know, if it's 11 o'clock 
in the morning at 12 o'clock, you have 100 people sitting down for lunch. The color of your skin is relatively material. You know, you really have to move. <laughs> and, you know, so this is what the kitchen is all about. Uh, I mean, for me, and uh, I've had a lot of pleasure. So trying to teach through the foundation to all of those people too has been uh, quite rewarding. And I'm, you know, really thankful to my, my son-in-law, my daughter and so forth. It really is so special. And I think that it, your foundation and the, the reasoning and behind it brings things full circle because going back to reading K Kitchen Confidential and learning about the types of people Right. That kitchen life attracts and how it's such a democratizing place and how people from all walks of life feel welcome. Well, isn't that just the natural next step to to give people who maybe don't always feel welcome in every area of of culture and society a place that they know they'll feel welcome and skills that are tangible and useful for life? I, I just love that so much. And I can I think it's yeah. such an amazing thing you're doing. And, and in our business, people are extremely generous. You know, so a few years ago, well, during the pandemic, my, my son-in-law again decided, you know, we cannot do fundraising that much for the foundation. So he said, you know, I have an idea. I'm going to do a video book and all that, asking chefs. So he asked Jose Andres, Daniel Boulou, Thomas Keller, Rachel Ray. I mean, you name it, all 50 of them to do a tape for the foundation. To 50 of them did it. So he asked another 50. They did it. Another 50. They did it. Another 50. Now we are at more than 200 video and any chef that you would know the name will probably be in there. And this is my biggest regret that uh, Tony could not be part of that because uh, it, we did that well in the last uh, couple of years, you know, two, three years. Uh, but it's amazing how generous the people have been. And uh, we have those 200, all 200 now video recipe and video tape and all that, that any student could access to it. And I think to be a member of the foundation, is like $40 a year, something like that. I mean, nothing. I, I mean, I think that you and I can agree, given all of our backgrounds, working in, in restaurants and in different culinary spaces, at the end of the day, the people who love to cook and the people who love to to eat are the best people. They're the people who want mm -hmm. to feed you and make you comfortable and warm and and happy and it just is so amazing that you're able to gather so many people i also imagine it's very hard to say no to jacques Pepin. <laughs> no one's saying no to you <laughs> you know when claudine was a year and a half old my daughter i hold her in my arm and i thought okay mélange stir it so she stir the pot so she could edit it because she made it because uh, so that was very important and my granddaughter is at bu now uh, she started that her second year at BU. When she was like four or five years old, I had a, a stool next to me in the kitchen. And I said, okay, give me the salad. You think it's clean? What, what do you think? It's clean that salad? Mm -hmm. So, okay, let's go get parsley in the garden. So go to the, the garden. I said, no, that chive, no, that saragon, no, that spot. You know. And then I take her to the market. I said, okay, I need tomato. Make sure they are ripe. Pear, did you smell the pear? Did you think they are ripe? So come back to that, establish a platform for communication, you know, that we start going to get. And then, of course, the sharing of the meal after. Then she's going to eat it because she, quote, made it. And uh, one conversation, of course, lead to another conversation. And the table itself, when you sit with people, is the great equalizer, too, because, you know, you're invited. You may be sitting next to the governor of Connecticut on one side and the other side, the guy, the dishwasher at the restaurant across the street. So I don't know. It doesn't really make any difference at that point at the table, you know. So it's it's for us. I mean, the kitchen and dining room has always been a great part of our life. I've, I've always thought one of the most beautiful things about sharing dinner with anyone is no matter what differences you have, you will have one thing in common and you have the same food in your mouth. I think it's a, you know, it's, it's a moment where as simple yes. as you I share mean, yeah. one thing in common for once in your life, I think it's a great thing. Yeah. I mean, certainly that the, it was. I mean, I think Louis XVIII in France in uh, 1814, I think, for the Congress of Vienna, decided he had the great uh, uh, people to go there and he had a great chef. And he asked uh, uh, Louis XVIII, told him, I'm going to give you more advice. He said, no, no, I need more cook. I need more cook. That was the idea, you know, and even when I was with the president in France, you know, you sit down, I serve like, I don't know where, Nero, Tito, Macmillan, those were the real estate at the time. Yeah, you sit down around the table, even if you have dissension, 
it ended up being more civilized to discuss it around the table without yelling at one another or insulting one another. Usually that never happened around the table when you, you know, share the food, the wine and all that. So you can have difference of opinion, but it's usually more polite and uh, more uh, organized. So that is very, very important. Mm. And that, that, that's why, well, anyway, we're not going to talk about Trump or anyone, but uh, <laughs> that could never work around the table unless you, you know what you're doing. Uh, mm. The kitchen the kitchen for me is really a big equalizer too in the dining room. I mean, in politics, it's very important. It's otherwise been. Well, I, was, I, was, I was curious. I mean, how, how does that feel that you being so influential for so many years, like... How does that feel to think to have you just sat down and imagined, wow, I've probably brought families together or with your foundation, maybe someone had a second chance at life for, you know, maybe you made someone fall in love because they made Jacques Papin's omelet, you know, in the morning, the, the night or the morning after. Have you ever just sat, maybe all the connection that you Again, created? as I said, you cannot, you know, take that too seriously, but mm -hmm. it's true that we get a lot of letters. People say, oh my God, during the pandemic, I look at your show and so forth, all those Facebook things, and, you know, it makes you feel good without any question. And and again, you know, people will relate to you. They don't know whether I'm a Republican, Democrat, whether I'm this, whether I'm that. It doesn't matter. I mean, that's the whole point. With food, you know, you can relate to people without getting into and still being civilized and polite right. and so forth, you know. It's a nice way to, to spend your life. I mean, and I've spent like, 80 years at that you, know, you, you have certainly spent a lifetime positively impacting the world through food and we are all better for it obviously you left such an impression on anthony bourdain as well which is why we are all here right now so how beautiful is that even more connection over yeah. food through someone that we all mutually admired we'd love to ask you if you have any final thoughts about uh bourdain or cooking or anything else that you'd like to mention what uh during our time together I, as I said, I regret that it couldn't be part of our group. Certainly, it would have been a show. And uh, when I learned of uh, him, uh, you know, in Strasbourg, I think it was in Strasbourg, yes, in France, when he killed himself, I, I was blown away. I mean, I was really, really sad. I mean, I wish I could have been there, you know, with him and maybe talk to him. And, you know, sometimes it doesn't take that much. You know, you mm -hmm. if you speak with someone and... You know, so it was a really, really sad, uh, sad thing. And I still feel it too and uh, miss him in many ways, you know. So, yeah, he was a great guy. Terribly tragic, but I guess in, in theme of this conversation, looking to the good that has come from his life and his legacy and, you know, basically eating well forevermore. <laughs> right, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. It's been Welcome. such an honor. Mm -hmm. um, and we hope that we get to meet up with you um, next time you're in the city. Um, maybe we can make omelets. I'll volunteer my kitchen. It's nothing special. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for all of your stories and your just insight and truly an honor. Career uh, highlight. Yeah. No, this is <laughs> really no big deal, frankly. So happy cooking to you. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Friends of Anthony Bourdain. You can listen along wherever you listen to podcasts. Please subscribe, rate, review. Let us know if there's someone you're dying for us to interview on the pod. And be sure to check us out on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, all the social media platforms at Friends of Anthony Bourdain.